بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عما يتساءلون عن النبأ العظيم الذي هم فيه مختلفون كلا سيعلمون ثم كلا سيعلمون الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه من استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا معهم الصالحات وتواصل بالحق وتواصل بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله تعالى the intent of this series of دروس is to cover as much of جزء عما as possible my intention for picking this particular uh, section of the Quran is because it's the most commonly memorized and uh, most commonly recited portion of the Quran and so it's probably most beneficial and most relevant to the average Muslim inshallah ta'ala just a few things in the introduction as to how we're going to be going about this this uh, tafsir um, really what I would recommend for anybody who's listening inshallah to the recordings and also you guys that are attending live is that you study a tafsir on your own as a complement to this, at least one tafsir, at the very least I would recommend going through tafsir ibn Kathir rahimahullah, at least that much, because that's available in English. As much as you can do of your own in terms of the readings as possible. And then inshallah ta'ala what we're going to be sharing here is something a little bit that complements what's already been read and what's already been researched or available to you easily. One of the fundamental purposes of this series is to illustrate how the Qur'an uh, or every surah of the Qur'an is a cohesive argument. How it's, u- it's unified and its subject matter is presented in a coherent fashion. So inshallah ta'ala, uh, because this is one of the aspects of tafsir that gets overlooked, in that when you are studying the tafsir of one ayah, and every word or every little grammatical nuance, and you go so far in depth into it, which is great, what ends up happening is you lose sight of the bigger picture. How is everything connected? How is this part of one discourse? Because you understand that this was originally recited without any tafsir. This was recited to an audience and there was no explanation. They were just hearing the words one ayah after another and they were processing this stuff. And first and foremost we understand that Meccan Qur'an in particular, it was being recited to predominantly a not believing audience. So you know for believers at least afterwards they can stop at every ayah and ask questions from the people of knowledge and learn more and more about the ayat. But first and foremost, Meccan Qur'an, and you know, Juz'amma is a great example of, and a good selection of Meccan Qur'an, um, is a discourse that is almost a message being delivered to non-believers. So it's a clear discourse in and of itself. So we're going to try to explore some of the clarity of thought, and the organization of ideas that are presented in each and every surah. Just a few introductory comments about surah, uh, the surah in the Qur'an in general. One of the most common, I think, in, in Wallahu A'lam, in my opinion, the uh, mistranslations of surah is chapter. That a surah is typically called a chapter of the Qur'an. You know, a chapter is basically one fundamental lesson. Okay, a chapter is trying to teach you one fundamental lesson, one central idea. A surah, however, can have many, many, many ideas. A surah closer in, in academic terms, the closest thing to a surah you could probably have is a course of study. So every surah is almost you know, an independent study in and of itself, even though each of these studies are connected to other studies in the Qur'an. So for example, Surah Al-Baqarah is connected to Surah Ali Imran and so on and so forth. They are their interrelationships. But a surah in and of itself isn't really a chapter for many reasons. One of which was that it covers more than one topic and it's, it's diverse in its topics. The second reason is that a chapter has a chronological or numerical kind of sequence. So you have chapter 1, the chapter 2, the chapter 3, the chapter 4, and if you learn something in chapter 4, you don't have to repeat it in chapter 5. And if there's a need to re- repeat it, the author will say, go refer back to chapter 4. He's not going to write it over again in chapter 5. But in Quran, Allah repeats things a lot. right? It's not like a chapter in a book. It's entirely different. Another reason we call it an independent entity is that in the Quran, for example, in Surah An-Nur, Allah calls the surah kitab. He calls a surah a book in and of itself. 
So he gives it a term that is used for an independent entity also. So for these few reasons, and finally for a linguistic reason, the word surah, uh, literally it comes from the outer walls of a city. And you know, if you if you can visualize in ancient cities, they didn't have borders or signs on the highway that said, welcome to this and this city. Rather, it was these outer walls that you had to go through. This was their security means, right? And inside the city, there's a lot going on. There's, 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 uh, you know, commerce taking place. There's residential areas. There's military. There's government. There's all these different things are happening, but somehow they're all connected and make one city. So that's kind of like what a surah is. There's a lot going on inside the surah, but somehow it's all organized and connected and forms a unified whole. So inshallah ta'ala, these are the few things we're going to explore. Two other things that we're going to try to highlight that are not as well documented in English literature at least. One is the relationship of the beginning of a surah with the end of the surah. And this is a consistent feature of the Qur'an. That every surah, somehow, what it begins with is somehow connected to what it ends with. There's a big, there's a cohesion between the beginning and the end of the surah. So the, the mafatih surah, the beginning, the openers of the surahs, and the khawatih. Also, there is a cohesion between the last thing you will read about in the previous surah and the first thing you will read about in the next surah. So there's a link between the conclusion of one surah to the introduction to, from the introduction to the next. And like we said, we're beginning with, with uh, Juz Amma, inshallah ta'ala. So now with Juz Amma uh, and, and Surah Naba, Surah Naba being the 78th surah of the Qur'an, the surah before it is Surah Al-Mursalat, surah number 77. And in surah number 77, we found two groups. In al muttaqina fi dhilalin wa'ayun, in ayah number 41, the people of Taqwa have been mentioned. And we will find in Juz Amma also towards the conclusion, we will find the mention of the people of Taqwa again. Also in Surah uh, uh, Al-Mursalat, the people that are referred to over and over again, the fundamental theme of Surah Al-Mursalat, the Surah before, is وَيْلُوِنْ يَوْمَ إِذِلْ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ This is the oft-repeated ayah of Surah Al-Mursalat, in which the al mukaddibin are being highlighted. These are the people who deliberately lie against the truth. They don't just lie, they lie against the people who speak the truth. So they accuse them of wrong. And they try to basically nullify their or, or invalidate their character and things like this. So they're falsifiers. They're propagators of falsehood. These are the mukaddibin. Now, Surah Naba begins with the phrase, Amma yatasa'alun. It begins with this common phrase that is, is very famous and commonly translated regarding what are they asking one another. It's a common, easy, simple translation of Amma yatasa'alun. So let's talk a little bit about tasa'ul so we understand the connection between surah number 77, the surah that came before, and its conclusions with what is coming now. Here we have Allah Azza wa Jal speaking about, uh, you know, uh, or Allah commenting on a discussion taking place between disbelievers. There are three opinions about the word, uh, the tafsir of the word yatasa'alun. First of all, its basic meaning, yas'alu ba'duhum ba'da, what that means is, yatasa'alun means they're asking one another. Some of them are asking others. One opinion is this being asked by disbelievers. That's one opinion. Another opinion is this is a discourse that is taking place between the disbelievers. They're, dis they're asking among each other. And a third position is that both the believers and the disbelievers are asking the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The, the rajih position, the closest to true position, and the, the one that's supported in the text, and also with other evidences, is the one that this is a discussion taking place of the kuffar among themselves. Okay, this is a discussion, or they're asking one another, each other, the kuffar among each other. But the thing is, we have to uh, understand in language, when you mutually ask a question to one another, when you're discussing something with one another, it can be done for one of two reasons. It can be done because you're curious. You don't know and you're asking somebody and they're asking somebody else and this is what's happening, right? So it's sort of an inquisitive intent. Another intent for asking one another is actually to undermine or to, to wage sarcasm at someone else. For example, if you just picture this scenario, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam presents these, you know, these phenomenal truths about the afterlife. Right, these huge things are going to happen. The oceans are going to boil over, over. The dead are going to come back to life. These huge things he's talking about. And as a means of undermining or making him look like he's insane, they say, you know, do you know what he's talking about? No, do you know what he's talking about? And they're kind of talking to each other. And this, this is a means of insulting him. Right? So the previous surah talked about those who do takdeeb. وَيْلٌ يَوْمَ إِذِلِّ And one of the most effective ways of doing takdeeb is to 
to mock or to undermine the statements of the other by means of sarcastic questions among yourselves. So this is what they were doing. They were saying, come on, really, we're going to come back to life? Is that, is that what he's really saying? Or, or he was saying that the, the mountains are going to sail away, or they're going to turn into carded wool. Or he's talking about us coming out of our graves like, you know, like, like locusts. What's he talking about? You know, so th this tone of undermining that we even know in language today, this is the tone that they were using. Now understand and appreciate this. The one responding to this in Surah Naba is Allah. Allah is basically listening to their conversation. So there's a third party here. The, the messenger is obviously a listener, a party to this conversation. The believers who are making da'wah are hearing this sarcastic conversation. But from the very beginning we learn there's a third party that is also listening to this discourse. It is Allah Azza wa And now Allah is depicting His reaction to their conversation. So what we learn in the beginning of the surah is Allah has taken offense to their, their sarcasm. Allah has taken offense to the way they speak about the Akhirah. So Allah says, عَمَّ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ Now, the, you know, just to, to, to add some context to what, what kinds of questions they're adding, because they've been asked all over the Qur'an, إِذَا كُنَّا عِظَامًا وَرُفَاتًا إِنَّا لَمَبْعُثُونَ خَلْقًا جَدِيدًا When we have been reduced to bones and decayed dust, you know, and when we just withered away in our graves, we're going to be raised again, a new creation altogether. These are the kinds of questions they were asking. When Allah Azza wa said, Alayha tis'ata ashar, right, on the hellfire there are 19 guardians of the angels, 19 have been appointed. One of them got up and said, well, they're just 19, I can take on that many. I can handle that much, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. So these are the kinds of criticisms and questions they were poking at the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa with. Which is why I would say, you know, nowadays a lot of times youth, they fall into these, you know, missionary websites or comments under some da'wah lecture by some atheist or by some agnost in YouTube that's writing some really blasphemous stuff. It's nothing new. They were saying this in the face of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa Anyhow. So Allah responds, And this is a continuation of the question. Are they really asking about an naba ul azim An naba in Arabic means news, but there's another word in Arabic for news which is khabar. So there are two words now. There's naba and there's khabar. What's the difference between naba and khabar? First of all, an naba ul a'zam, meaning naba is a greater kind of news. It's a more important news. That's one difference between naba and khabar. So you don't use naba for anything. Like if you know the store closes at 10 o'clock, that may be khabar. It's not naba. But you know, somebody won the election, or there's a war that started, or something huge happened, that would be considered naba. And that's how it's used in the Qur'an. Khabar, by the way, is used in the Qur'an twice, both times for the same context. When Musa alayhi salam is coming, uh, or is with his family in the desert and it's dark, and he sees a light from a distance, he tells them, maybe I'll get some khabar from there. Okay? Atikum bi khabarin. Maybe I'll bring you some kind of news. He doesn't know what the news is going to be. Maybe he'll ha they'll have some beneficial information. He's not sure, so he uses the word khabar. But when Allah speaks of nations that are destroyed in the past, Allah speaks of anba'u ma kanu bihi astazi'ud. Naba'u alladhina kafaru. The news of those who came before, but huge events. So this is the first difference between naba and khabar. The, th the second thing is, naba necessarily has a benefit. It necessarily, it is a news information that has some benefit for the person receiving it. Also, it demands a reaction, it demands an action. It's not just something you could say, oh, that's nice, and you sit there. But naba is something, when you hear it, it demands that you change something about yourself. Like naba would be, there's a fire in the building, right? Now, what does it demand from you? I got to get out of here, or I got to tell other people there's a fire, right? So this is another difference between naba and khabar. And finally, naba has buhur in it, as the linguists argue. What that means is that it's a manifest event. You know, there, there are kinds of there's abstract, abstract ideas and actual physical material events. Naba is a material event, something physical, something tangible, something you can see and touch. That's what a naba is. So when Allah speaks of the next life and resurrection as naba, He's referring to its tangible nature. You know, there are other religions who, who feel that the, the afterlife is some kind of a spiritual, intangible kind of thing. But even by the use of the word Naba, we know it is real, it's physical, and it's not a state of mind. It's actually a state, it's a place. That these, the, the Jannah and Naab are actual places. They're not just, you know, figments of the imagination or places in our mind. Anyhow, so this is Anil Naba Al Azim. Are they really asking about this enormous, and now Naba is enormous in and of itself, but Allah adds Azim to it as an adjective, as a sifa to it. So um, is it true that they're actually asking one another in this sarcastic tone about that enormous event, 
about that enormous news that is supposed to bring lead them to some kind of action, and yet instead of leading it to leading them to action, it's leading them to make this kind of ridicule as far as this news. And then Allah adds another rhetorical question. All of this is rhetorical questions so far. الَّذِي هُمْ فِيهِ مُخْتَلِفُونَ الَّذِي actually is, is called اسم uh, صِلَةً uh, Okay, اسم موصول rather. And هُمْ فِيهِ مُخْتَلِفُونَ And grammar is called صِلَةُ الْمَوْصُولُ All of this is an adjective of a naba. So the next ayah, ayah number three, is actually the whole ayah is an adjective of the word an naba. The first adjective is al عَظِيمُ And the second adjective is الَّذِي هُمْ فِيهِ مُخْتَلِفُونَ And a course translation is that which they are themselves in disagreement in or with, okay, they're among themselves, they are in disagreement in, a, in regards to this news. But the way the ayah is structured is in the ismiya form, in the nominal form. The benefit this has is, what this tells us is, this is something they're doing all the time. That this disagreement that they have among each other, Allah Azza wa Jal, for example, they didn't say, الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِيهِ يَخْتَلِفُونَ He said, الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِيهِ مُخْتَلِفُونَ The ism fa'il is used. And the noun usage indicates something that's going on constantly. Like a noun is permanent and a verb is temporary. Then the word fihi, this prepositional phrase, has been positioned in between hum and mukhtalifun. Instead of Allah saying, الَّذِينَ هُمْ مُخْتَلِفُونَ فِيهِ Which is norm in Arabic. Allah says, الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِيهِ مُخْتَلِفُونَ And what this produces is a shock. Is it really about that, that they are disagreeing among themselves? Now the word ikhtilaf, a little bit about it and we move forward inshaAllah ta'ala. Is it really about this, this uh, tremendous news that they are disagreeing among themselves in? The word ikhtilaf, it indicates two things. It indicates a manifest disagreement, meaning they're actually physically disagreeing among each other. What this tells us is not only were they being sarcastic about akhirah, they all had their own theories too. Some of them had the idea, okay, we're, nobody, we're not going to come back. Some of them had the idea, we're all going to go to heaven. Some of them had the idea, well, Allah has created so many huge things, the heavens, the earth, so many you know, stars in the heavens, etc., etc. How is he going to be busy with every little thing I did every single day? Who's going to keep track of all that? It's not going to be like that. He's going to let us go. It's gonna let, he's going to let things slide. Some of them had the idea, but no, we believe that, you know, ma'ad Allah, that Allah has daughters that are the angels. They're going to take care of us. They'll put in a good word for us. So even though we've messed up, we'll be all right. We're not going to be in this kind of trouble that he's talking about. Yeah, he'll be mad at some people who didn't have the intermediaries, the people to put in a good word for him. You know, this idea even exists today in life. It doesn't stem from just from religion, from life in general. Like, you know, if, you have a, if you're not a good employee, but you're good friends with the manager, then you're hoping that the manager will keep, your, keep you hired, even if the boss is complaining, because you're good with the manager. You don't have to deal with the boss who's going to deal with it. The guy in the middle, right? That's the idea. That's the mentality. I don't have to face the consequences of my actions. Somebody else will deal with it for me because I know some. I got connections higher up. That's the idea, right? And that's really the basis of shit. It's a lack of responsibility. You don't want to be responsible for your own actions. You put an intermediary in between. That's really the, the psychology of shit. Anyhow, so they have this, these different kinds of opinions about themselves. But ikhtilaf also means to have a discord or friction within one's own self. What this implies is not only did they disagree with each other, but they, within themselves there was uncertainty or disagreement. Sometimes they would think this, sometimes they would think that. They're not so sure. It's not like they're adamant about, no, 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 for sure there's no afterlife. Or for sure we're going to be saved. They're not sure either. They're not sure. So even within themselves there's a disagreement that is taking place. And that's what Allah Azza wa Jal depicts with these words. Then he says, Kalla sayalamun, thumma kalla sayalamun. This has been repeated, and oftentimes it's argued that this repetition takes place only for the purpose of mubalakha, which in English is called hyperbole, to emphasize something. You know, the old English translation of kalla sayalamun thumma kalla sayalamun is, nay, they're going to soon find out. Nay, then again, nay, they will soon find out. This is how it's commonly translated. Let's first explore the word kalla, and then we'll talk about the repetition. Kalla, you know, according to Sibawe and some other uh, grammarians, of mostly from Basra, they believe that this has to do with the word rada or stop. Meaning, whatever you're talking about, stop. You're going to find out very soon. As you put it in that context, right? They're running their mouth, and all of a sudden Allah says, stop. You're going to find out very soon. So that's one opinion of what kalla means. Another opinion, which is stronger actually from the language point of view, is depends on where kalla is used. If you say kalla, and you pause, and then you say sayalamun, it means something. But if you say, كَلَّا سَيْعَلَمُونَ together, then it means something else. 
Now if you say kalla and you pause, and you, then you say say alamun, like these grammarians argue in these ayat, it is jaiz, it is allowed that you stop at kalla and then you say say alamun. To produce that meaning, stop. Stop your nonsense. Stop this ridiculous argument. All of you be quiet. Nonsense. And then you're soon about to find out, say alamun, or they're about to find out rather. But on the other hand, if you continue and you don't stop, which is what the text of the ayah is, there's no waqf generally on the jama'ah, there's no waqf in the ayah, then the meaning of kalla is associated with haqqan. Truly you're going to find out. Like in English we say, in English usage, we say something like, oh no man, I'm going to be in real trouble. You know what does that mean? It doesn't mean oh no man, it means really I'm going to be in trouble. But you're using no in a way to emphasize or to, to, to hyperbolize your statement. Okay? No for real. You know? So you, you use the word no, but you don't really mean no. You mean actually, really, certainly. That's how it's used in classical Arabic also. So here, kalla say'alamun, no, the real, no, no, the reality is, soon they're going to find out. Thumma kalla say'alamun, no, no, again, the reality is very soon they're going to find out. The sa is short for sofa, and it implies that whatever's coming is very close. And Allah makes sure that we understand that it's close by the scene here, and at the end of this surah, inna andarnakum adaban, Qariba. We're warning you of a punishment that is close. So closeness here with the scene and closeness at the end with the word Qarib itself manifest. Now, so the, let's talk now about the repetition of the word Sayalamun or the ayat. Kalla Sayalamun, thumma kalla Sayalamun. One argument once again is that this is takrar lil mubalagha. This is repetition to hyperbolize or to illustrate Allah's anger with them that they're going to find out, they're going to find out. Now, this is the way we speak also. I'm going to get you, man. I'm going to get you. <laughs> you, you say it twice when you're really angry. Okay? Or if you're really in a, in a tense situation, you don't just say wait. You say wait, wait. Right? You say it twice. So the idea in language generally and also in classical Arabic, when you repeat something twice, it illustrates anger or tension or friction or something like that. So that's one opinion. The other opinion, which actually a lot of the Mufassirun have taken and seems more appropriate here, is consistent with the arguments in the rest of Quran. As far as the Quran is, Quran's warnings are concerned, they're basically, the warnings are of two events. Two things. One is resurrection, the day of judgment, that of all the events surrounding resurrection. And the second is the hellfire. One leading to the other. But the two predominant warnings are resurrection and qiyamah, and then annah. So there's a lot of description in the Quran of resurrection day, and there's a lot of description for hellfire. So it is believed that the first one, you're really going to find out that first one is referring to Qiyamah. And the second one is referring to Hellfire. So first you're going to realize how wrong you were and how obnoxious you were in the way you were talking about the Akhirah. The first time you will realize this, truly realize this when you face Qiyamah. And the second time when you face the Hellfire. These are the two places where you really get to know, right? So now, so uh, this is again the tafsir of why there is repetition between these two things. The final comment on this kalla say'alamun and thumma kalla say'alamun also. There is an axiom, man mata faqad qamat qiyamatuhu. Whoever dies, well his qiyamah has already started. Whoever dies, his qiyamah has already begun. For him, he doesn't have to wait until all the signs of the hour are done and the generations have passed and the sun rises from the, from the west, etc., etc. He doesn't have to wait for all that. His, his case is done. He's already seen what's coming. Like, for example, Ali radiallahu anhu used to say, nasu niyam, you know, the people are sleeping. The people are sleeping. And when they die, it's when, it's when they wake up. Right? So, this, for, in that sense, yes, immediately when a person dies, they'll really find out the consequences of the words they were uttering. Now, this, by the way, was the first passage of this surah. عَمَّا يَتَسَأَلُونَ عَنِ النَّبَئِ الْعَظِيمِ الَّذِي هُمْ فِيهِ مُخْتَلِفُونَ كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ Before we go on to understand one thing about the style of the Qur'an, one of the elements of Qur'anic studies is السَّجَعْ الْقُرْآنِ which is Qur'anic rhyme scheme. Right? You have عَمَّا يَتَسَأَلُونَ عَنِ النَّبَئِ الْعَظِيمِ This kind of breaks the rhyme scheme a little bit. الَّذِي هُمْ فِيهِ مختلفون. كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ Everything seemed to rhyme except one ayah which was عَنِ النَّبَئِ الْعَظِيمِ And if you study the grammar of the ayah, you'll find that that ayah connected to the next ayah is actually one sentence. عَنِ النَّبَئِ الْعَظِيمِ الَّذِي هُمْ فِيهِ مُخْتَلِفُونَ is one text. And to illustrate that that text isn't complete in and of itself, even phonetically it breaks. It breaks al-azim, it's a departure 
from the, the rest of the continuation of the text. So now, you know, one of the remarkable features of the Qur'an in many, many, many cases is that the rhyme scheme actually tells you where a paragraph ends or begins. Now notice, عَمَّ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ عَنِ النَّبَئِ الْعَظِيبِ الَّذِي هُمْ فِيهِ مُخْتَلِفُونَ كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ Now look at the next few ayat. Just listen to them. أَلَمْ نَجْعَلِ الْأَرْضَ مِهَادًا وَالْجِبَالَ أَوْتَادًا وَخَلَقْدَاكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ سُبَاتًا Do you notice a new rhyme scheme? Right? And you will notice as we study the subject matter, it is a different subject altogether. It is connected to this, but it's a different matter and it will be tied back together again. Now, again, because we're trying to study and appreciate the surah and how it's a cohesive whole and a cohesive argument, we need to understand this iltifat, this transition to another subject, which seems almost unrelated. For example, alam naj'alil arda mihada, easy translation, did we not turn the, ed, the, the earth, did we not make the earth into a plain, a smooth plain for you? Mihad actually comes, another word related with mihad is al-mahd. Al-mahd is the cradle, or even the womb of the mother. Okay, or the cradle in which the, the child is comfortable. Allah says, didn't we make the earth a place where you may be comfortable? Also, mihad is used in classical Arabic for a bed. So it's a place where you rest. This is the place where you, where you, where you find peace, where you find tranquility. Right? Allah, so Allah talks about His favors now. And as you will continue, we'll see Allah's favors and His creations being talked about. But what does that have to do with resurrection? What does that have to do with their criticism? You see, their, by and large, their criticism was the things you're talking about, this life after death, this sun and moon colliding together, the earth cracking open, and the earth spilling out, whatever, the akhrajat al ardu athqalaha, all these big things you're talking about, they sound too monumental. Nobody's ever seen anything like that happening. Uh, what kind of God is capable of all of these things? Now, human beings are very aware of what things they, are, they themselves are capable of. Right? We're capable of making a bed for ourselves. We're capable of maybe building a house for ourselves, etc., etc. Now you will find a discussion of how Allah's capability in your own visual experience, how it surpasses your own. So this is actually a comparison of one's own works, one's manufactured works, in comparison to some of the creations of Allah. Look at what you're able to make for yourself and compare that to the entire creation of the earth. أَلَمْ نَجْعَلِ الْأَرْضَ مِهَادًا Then we are able to construct monuments and structures and things like this, or we're able to pitch tents. Literally, we pitch tents. In the old times, you pitch tents. Allah says, Wal jibala awtada. And you know, there's a lot of scientific discussion about Wal jibala awtada. I'm not going to go into the scientific route. I'm going to just illustrate to you the language point of view. Allah says, Didn't we make the mountains or install the mountains as pegs? And awtad was used, for example, wa fir'awna dil awtad. Also, we find in the Quran. We're going to see this in a, in a surah later on. And Fir'aun, who is known by his awtad, his pegs, because his thousands and thousands and thousands of soldiers would march and they would camp out and when the soldiers camp out somewhere what do they do? They set up these pegs and these tents. So a tent is known by the most important element of the tent which is what? The peg. And this is a feature of Arabic. You call something by its most essential component. Right? So you can actually call a warrior a sword because that's his most essential thing. Right? So the, the, a tent is called also a peg in classical Arabic only because that is the most important, if you don't have the peg the tent is gone. Allah says you're able to pitch these tents, let me show you the kinds of tents I pitch. What, and what are the kinds of tents? What comparison do you have in your your imagination to what Allah Azza wa is capable of? Then we speak, now these are big things but now let's look within, within the human being's own creation. And we created you, all of you, this mafrul bihi kum, all of you, azwajin, this is hal, in the state of pairs. You didn't pair yourselves. You didn't create a pair. You didn't create woman. Man didn't create woman. Woman didn't create man. We created you like this. This is not your own manufacturing. This is being given to you. You're not even capable over your own creation. Your own gender, you're not capable over. Your own spouse, you're not capable of the spouses that you've been created in. So you've been created in two different genders. And this is again, the creative power of Allah as manifest even on the rebel himself, the kafir himself who's listening to this. He knows even that I've been created in pairs and I'm not the one who was in charge of this. I didn't design this myself. Then Allah Azza wa goes forward and goes to eat to the person himself. He says, وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ subata," And we made your, your sleep. Nawm is sleep, deep sleep. You know how Allah says in Ayatul Kursi, لا تأخذوه سنة ولا نوم. Sina is slumber, like sleepiness, drowsiness, and nom is deep sleep. 
right? So Allah says, He made your deep sleep subata. Now, sabata sha'arahu, for example, a phrase in Arabic means the person cut off his, a lock of his hair. Okay? Or if you say sabata sayra, when you cut the string. Literally, this subat means that which is, that cuts off. It cuts off. So Allah speaks of night as something that cuts you off. What does it cut you off from? First of all, it cuts your body off from what? Your soul. Your soul departs from your body. Right? You're not in charge of this. It's, it leaves you and you're not in charge of it. Then it cuts you off from your daily affairs, your work, your business, your, your, your concerns, your tasks. Everything is cut off. You're cut off from your family. You're cut off from your affairs. You're cut off from everything in life as soon as you hit deep sleep. It's like you're dead to the world. You don't exist for those few hours. Nothing you do matters at that point. Because you're not relevant to the world when you are asleep. You're cut off. You're cut off. And this is actually very important because it's a foreshadowing of what Allah will talk about in a little bit as coming in the surah, which is Resurrection Day. And because on Resurrection Day, one of the most essential features of Resurrection Day is all human beings will be cut off. They will be cut off from one another. The way that is depicted in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Azza wa says, وَتَقَطَّعَتْ بِهِمُ الْأَسْبَابِ All of their relationships will be chopped off. And in the surahs that are coming, we will read, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ The man will learn, run away from his brother, from his mother, from his father, right? وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ Similarly, we found in Surah Al-Ma'arij before, a similar passage. So, this is the kind of cutting off that will be permanent, that is going to be mentioned a little bit later on. But you experience something from that being cut off every single day. You can't even help your sleep. You can't go, no matter how long you try to avoid your sleep, in the end you will be overpowered by it. And this is the power Allah has on even the one who disbelieves. Even the one who denies Allah. Even the one who doesn't believe in the hereafter. So this is actually the argumentation, the flow of argument. The logic here is, you are so adamant in disbelieving in the hereafter because you think it's so impossible. Here are the powers Allah has on you. Here are the powers that you see manifest in the light in, your, in the creation around you. Are you in denial of those powers? And you think the one who created all of these things, and is so much control even on your own self, your own body, that you have to go to sleep every night, or every few hours, that that one doesn't have the power to create life again? Anyhow, so let's go further inshallah ta'ala, because we're running out of time. وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ سُبَاتًا وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا And we and we made the night a means of garment. We made the night a garment. Now why, why, is, the night, why is the night called a garment? Because it, the idea is it covers you up. It takes over you like a blanket. And the garment is something you hide underneath. And you know people hide in the night. Crimes take place in the night. Secrets are associated with the night. Ambush is associated with the night. Robbery is associated with the night. Right? These are the things that are associated with night because it's secrecy. But the other thing here that's, that's illustrated is this is a libas, this is a cloth that is put on you that you don't have the power to take off. You're not, you're not capable of getting rid of the night. You can turn the light off in this room, but that doesn't get rid of the night. The night has overcome everyone, like the day overcomes everyone. So Allah Azza wa made the night manifest over you. Another means by which the creation of Allah overpowers all of the creations on the earth, the night. وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا وَجَعَلْنَا النَّهَارَ مَعَاشًا and we made the, the daytime, this word ma'ash, it could be laf zaman, it could be an adverbial you know, uh, phrase or, or, or a, a noun depicting time or space. Literally here, time. And it could be uh, an infinitive, what's called a masdar. And we'll talk about what that means in the ayah. وَجَعَلْنَا النَّهَارَ مَعَاشًا And we made the bright day, the morning time, or the daytime, a means of livelihood and a time of livelihood. These are the two implications of ma'ash. That the, the, the daytime is a means by which people... Uh, earn their, their income and this is particularly true in the desert because in the, there are very few patches of desert where there's actually farmland and those are the critical aspects of desert life because that's where the you know, food from, for the entire region is coming and that food will not grow until it gets what? Sunlight so the daytime is a means by which life is delivered and then also this is the time in which business takes place and most work takes place. It's in the daytime. Even today in the most modern of times, the stock market opens up in the morning and closes at night. It's, it's the, you know, when you get a job, it's, you know, the, the normal average job for people isn't the night shift, it's the day shift. Most people work in the day. So this is the time for which it, uh, it's installed for earning one's income and getting ma'ash, a means of livelihood. Then Allah speaks finally, وَبَنَيْنَا فَوْقَكُمْ سَبْعًا شِدَادَ And we, we constructed, built above you, سَبْعًا شِدَادَ And فَوْقَكُمْ here, you know if you look at the other ayat that just came, in all of them there was some 
uh, implication, if not direct, indirect of the human being. We made the, the, the night as a means of garment. Garment for who? For us. A means of earning uh, the day, a means of earning wealth or earning livelihood for who? For ourselves. So there's all, it always comes back to us and our powerlessness over even the creations of Allah and how dependent we are over other things that Allah has created for us. So now again, here, وَبَنَيْنَا Allah didn't just say, وَبَنَيْنَا سَبْعًا شِدَادًا We constructed seven intense skies, or seven intense, powerful, flawless heavens. Rather, He added, فَوْقَكُمْ We constructed above you, we constructed above you these seven heavens. And this, this bina, this construction, the idea of construction, again a comparison to human ability. Human beings construct things too. Now compare whatever you've been able to construct as human beings to what Allah has constructed. Sab'an shidada, subhanAllah. See, this constantly we're being put in our place. The idea of the whole, these arguments is the human beings being put in their place. You don't, you don't deserve to be talking like this about the hereafter. You need to know your role. You need to know how meek, how powerless you really are. So, وَبَنَيْنَا فَوْقَكُمْ سَبْعًا شِدَادًا And then on top of this, وَجَعَلْنَا سِرَاجًا وَحَاجًا And then we installed Siraj. Siraj in Arabic, Majazan, in allegory or implied, it refers to anything that emits light or anything that is lit. But in the Qur'an, consistently it is used to refer to the sun. Then we add, to, add this to the word ism mubalagha, it's called wahaja. Wahaj is actually from wahaja yahaju wahjun, this is the, the, the base meaning. Something that is brilliant and blazing. And then add to it wahaj, the, the form that's used in Arabic is that which hyperbolizes. So an incredibly brilliant blazing lamp we installed for you. So of all the things, all the fires you're going to be able to kindle on the earth, all the chandeliers you'll be able to create, what is going to compare? What is going to compare? to this creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, an illustration of the powerlessness of the human being. At the same time, an illustration of the creative power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْمُعْصِرَاتِ مَا أَنْفَجَّاجَ This is a very beautiful ayah of the creative power of Allah. He says, and we sent down من المعصرات You know, a'sara in Arabic, or i'sar the masdar, is it means to squeeze. To squeeze. And this is referring, one opinion is this is referring to the winds. The winds come and they literally squeeze the clouds and then the clouds get, drip what? Rain. So that's one image that's being presented, that the winds, they end up squeezing the clouds. Like in the asad is used in classical Arabic for a cloth that is drenched and you know you twist it and you squeeze it and water comes out. Also, asad is used for the clouds that are full of water that can't hold anymore and end up dripping. So these are the two implications that we sent by means of the mu'asirat, by means of these squeezed or the clouds that get squeezed by winds or the clouds that are drenched in, in water. Ma and thajjaja, water that is thajjaj. Thaj, literally, it means overflowed or heavy profuse kind of rain or flooding. So we sent this intense kind of water supply that again human beings can't compare to. Rather, we know that water is a means by which human beings are either overpowered, either by the overflow of it, or by the lack of it. When Allah doesn't send it, it can create death and famine, and when Allah sends too much of it, it can create death and famine, or death and destruction, right? Flooding. So Allah Azza wa Jalla again illustrating His power over the human being. And now you will find a, t a, a change in tone of mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how, how many favors He has given to you. <laughs> so we may derive or ex you know, extract by means of it, the he here, the lamir referring to ma, to water. So by, by means of the water so that we may um, extract. Habban wa nabata. Habban is used for all kinds of grain, all kinds of wheat, all kinds of crop. And nabat is used for all kinds of grass or vegetation. So all kinds of basically the sustenance of this earth. The earth, if, if not for vegetation, if not for, for plant life, then there is no earth, life on this earth. Because whatever we consume in the end, consumes plant life. Right? So anyway, لِيُخْرِجَ بِهِ حَبًّا وَنَبَاتًا وَجَنَّاتٍ أَلْفَافًا And above and beyond that, jannat specifically, lush gardens, alfaf is the plural, it could be argued of lafif, though there are other opinions also. Lafif means that which is wrapped around. So the idea is gardens in which the trees and the branches and the and you know these these plants they are intertwined among each other. They're so intricately connected to each other. It seems like they're tangled among each other. This is wajannatin al fafa. Plants so close together and so lush that you can't tell where one ends and the other begins. Right? That's jannatin al fafa. That's the imagery that's been presented. 
Now, after all of this explanation of creative power, this was the second paragraph, by the way, the second lesson of the surah, to compare human ability or human inability to the creative power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, go back to the first paragraph, what was the whole problem? The whole problem was a denial of the hereafter. So now it's coming back to that problem. Now that you've been put in your place, now we can talk about that which you were asking about or being sarcastic about. Allah Azza wa says, Inna yawm al kana miqata. No doubt. The day of al fasl al fasl in Arabic is to take, literally means to take two things that are together and to separate them so much that they're clearly apart from one another. And this is one of the descriptions of the Day of Judgment. The ulama comment that it's called Yawm al-Fasl, the Day of Separation, or the Day of Clear Distinction, because for one, on that day, truth will be separated from falsehood. And in this dunya, people say some truth and mix it with some falsehood. This is what the mushrik did. He, it's, like, it's not like he said, I'm not going to believe in Allah. He believed in Allah and other things with Allah. Right? So and the people even who do bad, they say at least we're doing some other good. They mix good with evil. They mix truth with falsehood. This is a day when all of this will be separated. A person will be separated from his false hope. A worshipper will be fo- separated from his false gods and the hopes that he placed in them. A tyrant will be separated from his power. Right? All of these things that we that are together now will be separated. Allah Azza wa Jalla speaks in Baqarah about followers being separated from their leaders. Right? The people, the people who used to be followed will disassociate themselves with the people who used to follow them. Right? So anybody who used to follow trends of, you know, nowadays are kids or whoever they're following the trends of their friends in school or celebrities on TV and things like that. On that day, they will want nothing to do with their fan base. They'll walk away from them. I want nothing to do with them. That's their own doing. I have nothing to do with them. So, and, and similarly, the elders, we follow sometimes our family traditions. We'll go into haram to keep up with family tradition. Because our, you know, our family does things this way. That's why we have to do it this way. On that day, none of this will matter. Your uncle or your grandfather or your cousin for whom you wanted to show your face and, and engage in riba or do this haram business or have that inappropriate gathering, they won't care for you on that day. They'll walk away. They'll walk right off. So anyway, in the yawm al-fasli, kana miqatan, probably perhaps the most graphic depiction of that fasl that Allah Azza wa Jalla describes is that on that day, the mother will be separated from uh, her child. Right, that's the probably the most graphic description of Al Fasl on that day. May Allah save us on that day. Fayyad, inshallah ta'ala, we'll, we'll try and close with this ayah because it's almost time for salah, right? So I'm going to wrap some uh, some things up about this ayah and we'll conclude. Bi'idhnillah. Allah says, Inna yawm al kana miqata. The day, this day of separation, this day of parting, this day of clear distinction between two things had already been appointed. Miqat is what's called Dharf Zaman. This time had was bound to come. It was a fixed time. It was like clockwork. It had to happen. Right? Like the, the hour has to strike. You know, if you notice all the things, or many of the things that Allah spoke about, the, the creation of pears, the growing of plants, the sun, right, the night and the day, things that have a fixed time. Things that have a, an appropriate time for them. Just like that, this life also has a zawj. It's paired with something. What is it paired with? It's paired with the next life. It's got a time too. It's just, you know, just like regularly you expect the season to change, so you expect the afternoon to change into the evening, the evening to the night, the night to the morning. Just like that, expect. It is appointed, it is fixed, that this time has to come. It is just, we're headed towards that direction, whether you like it or not. And this is depicted in another place that we're going to see soon, inshallah ta'ala. Ya ayyuhal insan, innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan fa Human being, you better realize you are marching forward towards your Lord minute by minute, second by second, without your, your, your knowledge even, and you're going to get to meet Him. It's like no matter what you do, you know, we're all on this, you know, those conveyor belts in the airports that walk you quickly. We're standing on it, whether we realize it or not, we're moving in that direction. We're headed towards our Lord. May Allah Azza wa Jalla save us from humiliation on that day. Bismillah ta'ala, uh, after the uh, Shah prayer, we'll try and conclude the dars on Surat an Naba. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك السلام عليكم. Look at this. الرسول in the previous ayah. I should have been alongside the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم. And in the next line he says, man, I wish I didn't take that guy as my friend. Which guy? The guy that took you away from the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم. The guy that made you do things that the messenger would never do صلى الله عليه وسلم. 